excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning, amen? Would you stand up and join us as we get ready to praise and worship? Father God, this morning we come to you with hearts of gratitude. We're thanking you for another day of life. We thank you for the opportunity to be in this place. We ask you to receive our worship in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the church says, amen. All right, church. Here we go. I want to invite you to lift up your voice this morning. Help us sing the Lord's Prayer this morning. Say, oh, Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. We say, Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day. Your kingdom come, Father, let your will be done 
morning, Gloria Day. My name is Randy Miller, one of the pastors here. And we enter into a time of prayer where we offer up our prayers, anything that's worrying us, anything we're celebrating to our Lord. So would you pray with me together? Lord, we come before you this morning and we thank you that your love awakens us and that we're alive because you're alive, that you died a death we deserved and rose from the grave to give us hope and victory, meaning and purpose in our life. Lord, we thank you for the grace that you shower upon us and the love that you pour into our lives. Help us to reflect that into our community, into our neighborhoods, our schools, wherever you send us. Lord, this past week, we also lift up those who have just struggled and were devastated by natural disasters. We lift up all the residents of Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, all those affected by the devastating storms. We pray, Lord, that you would be with those who lost loved ones, that you would be with the relief workers and give them strength in the cleanup effort and that you would help people put their lives back together again and see that your faith and your son Jesus is the foundation to build on. Lord, we also lift up wars and terror and hate that's across the world. Lord, we pray for an end to violence, and we pray that the Prince of Peace would rule and reign not only in our world, but also in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, we lift up our capital campaign that we're launching today. We pray your blessings upon it, and we pray for your wisdom in our response and how you're prompting us to make a bigger impact into the next generation, into our children and youth, so that they would have that same faith in your son, Jesus Christ, to give them a hope and a future. Lord, we pray all this, and we pray everything that's weighing on our hearts that you would answer those prayers according to your good and gracious will for our lives. We pray, Lord, in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. I invite the congregation to please be seated as we receive our offerings. And as we receive our offerings, we're reminded that God is so gracious to us that he provides for our every need. So as the ushers come through, we invite you to pass that pew or pass the uh, <clears throat> offering plate down the aisle for you. And as we gather, we continue our worship and prepare our hearts for Holy Communion.
Praise the Holy Father, we thank and praise you that you are our everything. That in you, there is grace, there is forgiveness, there is life. We give you thanks for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the promise that in you, we can do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. Filled with your spirit. So Lord, bless us now as we study your word. Open our hearts, our minds, our lives to not only hear, but to live it. In Jesus' name. Amen. There are, there are times in every one of our lives. Oh, by the way, I'm Dan Shetman, one of the pastors here. It is great to, if I haven't met you yet, it's great to meet you. Uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, there are times in every one of our lives where we reach a point of a critical decision. Places where that decision we make will have a huge impact and effect for the rest of our lives. Whether it's a fork in the road or a T in the intersection of life, we have to make a choice of whether we go to the right, whether we go to the left, or whether we just stop. You see, when a, when a jetliner reaches a runway speed of 120 miles an hour, it's got to either commit or stop. A critical decision for a young man to get on a knee and pop a question. And that bride-to-be to make a critical decision to say yes. You see, when it's fourth and one and you're down by five, coach got to make a decision. And he's either a hero or a zero. Whether it's a new job, a career change, a move, the choice of college when to start a family, whatever it might be, those are all critical points of decision. And how we respond to those points of decision, those critical points, oftentimes shapes our entire life. I want you to think about this. There was a critical decision made, and the world was changed forever because of a decision made by Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve made the decision to doubt God's word and believe a lie, and disobey his word, sin entered into the world. Perfection was lost. Perfection was destroyed. And they were banished now to live a life of sin. But praise be to God that another critical decision has been made. That God, out of his infinite love for us, made the decision to send his son. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. He sent his son into our world to die our death, to rise victoriously so that we might live in him, defeating sin, death, and the evil one, and have victory in our lives. Till one day he brings us home to himself. But until that time, he invites us to have this abundant life in him. And so this morning we are embarking upon a journey. And we're asking God to show up in immeasurably more ways than we could ever ask or imagine. As Glory Day faces a critical decision in the ministry of the next generation of people who will not only come through these doors but go out into our community. A critical decision to take a strategic step that focuses on our kids, our students, and our families that we pray God will continue to use Gloria Day in the next 50 years for Kingdom Impact. You see, we are standing under the shade of trees that were planted for us 50 years ago. Kingdom Impact this congregation 50 plus years now, what does it look like 50 years from here? That we might have Kingdom Impact not only in this congregation, but in our community. And the spaces where we live, where we, where, where we work, where we learn, where we play, where we gather. When I first arrived here at Gloria Day in 2013, there was a concerted effort to rebuild the family of Gloria Day. There was a very intentional approach of helping one another live life with Jesus every day. Some of you know what I'm talking about, others you don't, that's fine. But Gloria Day experienced an incredibly challenging season of ministry. And Gloria Day made a critical decision to bring some, well, younger guy 
from a little town in Peachtree City, Georgia, south of Atlanta, from a much smaller congregation to take on the mantle of leadership here at Gloria Day. I was called to serve here at Gloria Day from a wonderful congregation of 400 incredible people to a congregation of incredible people but of 2,600. I had no idea what that meant. But I was to continue that healing and set Gloria Day on a vision to make kingdom impact in our community. For over 18 months when I first got here, I spent a lot of time building relationships and learning the ministry of Gloria Day. I will tell you during that time, God's favor and blessing continued to shower down on the people and ministry of Gloria Day. There was an incredible amount of healing that took place. And it was time to then build on the one another. And I asked the board if we could shift our mission statement to one word. To expand now what we're already doing within Gloria Day to beyond Gloria Day. And I asked if we could just make a simple shift in our mission statement from helping one another to helping more people live life with Jesus every day. That shift would say to continue to take one another, take care of one another, but expand the ministry to help more people live life with Jesus every day. And so that decision helped us call a church planner. We planted a church in League City, South Lake, is now its own chartered congregation. I shifted one of our staff members from their position to a what we call serving beyond. Their job was to completely focus on the outside. And then we started on the course of building a discipling culture here at Gloria Day. Pastor Brian Weaver started that process, and then as God called him to Peace Lutheran Church in Hearst, Texas, we brought on Jason Phelps as a discipling director. And then this wonderful thing called a pandemic happened. But through that whole time, we have been focused on building intentional discipling culture at Glory Day. And we are now beginning to see the fruit of these endeavors in the hearts and lives of those who have engaged and started the journey with us. And so as we continue to build that discipling culture, we believe now is the next step to focus on our kids and student ministries. Y'all, our children are dealing with so much more than we ever had to deal with. The issues that they are facing in terms of identity, in terms of mixed messages, in terms of lifestyle, in terms of the pressures of social media, things that we can't even fathom. We believe that Glory Day must speak into equipping families. We believe the church has to speak truth from God's word into an ever-changing culture that there is truth that will set us free. And, and, and there is clarity in God's word. And if the church isn't doing it to our kids, who's going to? And I believe it's important that the church supports mom and dad or grandparents in the faith formation in the home. It's not our job. It's to partner alongside the home. To face this culture to, and live a biblical, Christ-centered life. This is a critical decision for the life of Gloria Day as we're rebuilding a pipeline of growth in our kids and students. We're intentionally focusing on kindergarten through grade four. Not excluding anybody else, but to build a pipeline of students that will then, as we grow K through four, it flows into fifth and sixth, it flows into seventh and eighth, it flows into high school and beyond. And so to do that, I, we brought on Audrey Densey Werner, a director of Family Life. Very intentional decision to bring a seasoned master DCE on board to build systems and relationships to set the foundation for our family ministry. She's been doing a phenomenal job. And we're already seeing growth in our younger families. And I'm praying that we are, have the opportunity to bring two full-time interns on to Gloria Day in January to not only assist Audrey, but to learn from her as she develops them and mentors them. And so in order for us to accomplish not only that decision and 
necessary upgrades and improvements in our main building, we are beginning this immeasurably more capital campaign. If this is the first time you've heard about this, um, open your email, please. Please. There has been so much that's gone on about it, so don't admit it, but start opening it, okay? And we're bringing in this immensely more capital campaign, asking God if he would show up immensely more than we ever could ask or imagine as we're raising people, not money, we're raising people, raising the joy of generosity, the grace of giving, that will result in raising $5.5 million above and above our regular giving over the next three and a half years. It's going to be a critical decision for you to join me and the leaders of Glory Day to move forward in faith, trusting in God's grace, his protection, an opportunity for us to grow in our understanding of stewardship, our view of money, generosity, and trust in God's provision. And so during these next five weeks, the month of October, we're going to be hearing from God's word about how he shows up in a measure more ways in the life of his people. So I'd ask you to open your Bibles. Turn to Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3, uh, we hear about a critical decision in the life of God's chosen people. And as you're looking it up, let me give you a little context of the section of Scripture. It's on page 179 if you have the Bibles in front of you. The book of Joshua deals with much more than ancient history. It's what God did for centuries ago for the Jews, it's about my life. It's about your life. It's about the life of the church today. It's about what God wants to do in and through us for the here and now for those who trust in him. It's about a victory of faith and glory to God when his people love and trust and obey him. You see, we've been saved by grace through faith. To live with Jesus forever. God sent his son to redeem us, claim us as his own. We are baptized into Christ. Our identity is in him, in Christ Jesus, in him crucified, in him resurrected. And as we live out our lives as baptized child of God, children of God, redeemed and loved by him, we are his beloved, we are his masterpiece. We celebrate his grace and forgiveness in our lives on a daily basis. And the goal is to put away the guilt, fear, and shame and live in his grace. And he's given us the Holy Spirit so that we can have this abundant life in him. And as I read the book of Joshua, I'm, read, I'm, I'm reminded about a quote that I read earlier on in ministry. I don't know who I got it from. It sounds Max Lucatoism, but I will say it is. Uh, it says, in life, we can be an overcomer or we're overcome. We're either a victim or a victor, a winner or a whiner. God saved us by his grace to live, to be his own and live in him with him forever. He did not save us to sit back, eat bonbons and watch life go by. He saved us to make us ambassadors of the gospel as we move forward in faith to claim our inheritance in Jesus Christ. For Israel, it was the promised land. For us, it's heaven. And if you look one page over, Joshua chapter 1. Joshua, Moses gave Joshua a command and a promise in this transition of leadership. Look what Joshua 1.9 says. Have I not commanded you? Here's a command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. Why did he say that? The dude is taking over Moses' job. You know, the guy that the ten plagues, the Red Sea, the whole, I mean, wow. And the promise the end of this verse, the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Remember 40 years earlier, Josh was one of the 12 spies that were sent across in the promised land, and they were supposed to report back to the nation of Israel what was all there. This was 40 years after they'd been freed from Egyptian slavery and captivity. You know, the whole Red Sea thing and fed by manna and quail. 
and, and they were to take possession of Canaan. And, and the Israelites sent out 12 spies to check it out. So what's out there? 12 spies returned to Moses and reported the land was indeed flowing with milk and honey. But 10 of the spies made a critical decision and lived in fear and discouraged the people by saying that Israel was not strong enough to overcome the enemy. That there were giants living in that land. This was a critical decision for the life of Israel. Do they trust God that the promised land is theirs or do they believe the ten spies? Well, they chose the ten spies. And even though God had done miraculous things for them, they forgot. And so instead of overcoming the land that was promised to them by God, they were overcome by the land. Instead of claiming victory in God's promises and moving forward in faith, they became the victims. And instead of winning... They turned to whining. The nation of Israel made a decision to listen to those faithless spies. And as a result of Israel's lack of faith in God's protection, provision, and care, they were not allowed to enter the promised land for another additional 40 years until that generation of people had died off. Joshua 3 is 40 years later. The mantle of leadership has been passed from Joshua to Moses, or from Moses to Joshua. The national dream of a homeland has been the central focus of two complete generations of Israelites. Time has come, another critical decision. It's time to get their feet wet. What do I mean by that? Look at Joshua chapter 3. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim. And they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, the officers went to the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priest, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it, in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Let the Lord God, the Ark of the Covenant, lead you there. Then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant, pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant, and they went before the people. And then the Lord said to Joshua, today, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that all may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, Command the priest who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Here's the thing they're supposed to do. Grab the Ark of the Covenant, and remember you can't touch it or you'll die. Walk in front of the people, let the people see the presence of the Lord is going in front of them, and go to the Jordan and flood stage and stand there. Get your feet wet. Think about it. The end of the wilderness wandering is about to happen. In three days, they're going on the greatest adventure of their lives. They have no idea what lies ahead of them. They have no idea what's gonna, what great works God's going to do on behalf of them to possess this land. I want you to think about it. They would see the walls of fortified cities, Jericho, fall down before their very eyes. Complete armies destroyed by Gideon and his three, 300 men. They would see an enemy so terrified of them, they would just run. And then they begin to enter God's rest. But there was this barrier. The Jordan River, it's at flood stage. No means to get across this body of water could be as wide as a mile at flood stage. They can't swim across, can't build enough rafts or boats to transport over a million people. They don't have time to build a bridge. No boats, no bridge, no resources. What do they do? How do you cross this physical barrier, barrier before the promise becomes a reality? The instructions, grab the ark, go stay in the water. That's all. Now, I don't know about y'all, I need a little more detail than that. I like some plans, I like to have them looked at by an architect, and I like to have some other things, you know, OSHA needs to check that out also, and let's just figure out how this is all going to work. No. He says, be obedient. I'm thinking, like, are you serious? Look how Joshua continues, verse 9. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, come here. And listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, here is how you shall know that the living God is among you. 
and that he will without fail drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Ammonites, the Jebusites, and all other ites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore take 12 men for the tribes of Israel from each tribe of man. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing. And the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. Joshua doesn't give him some kind of religious pep talk. He says just be obedient. Trust the Lord. Critical decision. Verse 14. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan, with the priests bearing the ark of the cup before the people, and as soon as those bearing the ark had come as far as the Jordan, the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped into the brink of the water. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks through this, out, this time of the harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is by, beside Zarethan. And those flowing down toward the Sea of Araba the salt sea were completely cut off. And the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on the dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. It didn't make sense. Stand in the water and it will stop flowing. Do you trust me? They had to press in the word of God that he would provide for their safety. I got to tell you, five and a half million is a big number. And there's some things like, oh, Lord, that's a big number. Will I be faithful? Will I trust in God's care, trust, and provision? Do I believe in the vision of this congregation to reach the kids for the next generation. If you take a look at scripture and you look at Hebrews chapter 11, there were folks, everyday folks, men, women, different backgrounds, different training, different personalities, different ways of serving God. But they all had one thing common. They believed God's promises and they were obedient. Women of faith who got their feet wet. Glory day. It's time to get our feet wet. It's time for us to trust in God that he will do immeasurably more in our lives than we could ever ask or imagine. I'm going to close with this. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 to 21 are our theme verse for this entire campaign. But it actually is a closing of a prayer that I've been praying for Gloria Day probably the last year. In Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 14, Paul has been praying for the people of Ephesus. It's the second prayer that he wrote. The first one was in chapter 1. This is the second one. And that the people would grow in their faith and see their role as disciples of Jesus who live out the great commission as a disciple who makes disciples who make disciples. As I've been praying about how do we help more people live life with Jesus every day, how can we help our kid, kids live out their faith in the spaces where they live and where they learn? So I'm going to personalize this prayer because I believe it's a prayer for glory today as well. Here's Paul's words. For this reason, what's the reason? Well, because the mystery of God has revealed that the salvation is for all people, not just the Jews. For this reason I bow before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ's glory day may dwell in your hearts through faith. 
And I pray you, Glory Day, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Man, I pray every Sunday morning that every person that comes to these doors will experience God's grace in whatever way, form, shape it could be. I want you to know how high, wide, deep the love of Christ is for you. And to know, Gloria Day, that this love surpasses knowledge. That you, Gloria Day, may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. And then look how Paul ends this. It's a benediction. It's a conclusion. It's like the end of the Lord's prayer. Because God's got the power to do it. Look what he writes. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I asked Omar Aguilar, our director of contemporary worship, if he would find some songs for us in this campaign. And good old Rick Rosenhagen challenged him even further and said, why don't you write a song, Omar? And he did. And I'm so thankful that Omar and, and David Cervantes, who's part of our facility crew, are going to share that with you because I want you to know that in all things, God is working through his people. This campaign is, is not about fundraising. It's about faith raising. It's about people raising. It's about developing the health and growth of our congregation so that we might live our lives in him, so that we can get our feet wet, so that we can see God will do immeasurably more in our hearts, lives, and faith than he could ever ask or imagine. Hey, good morning, church family. Today I'm excited to share a new song that, that David and I wrote uh, and inspired uh, by our capital campaign, Measurably More. This song reflects our faith in uh, God's limitless potential and his promise to provide beyond what we can ask or imagine. Uh, as we embark on this journey together, let's remember that with God, we're not just seeking more, but we're believing for immeasurably more. And so let's lift our voices, our hearts, as we celebrate with this vision together. Now to him who is able to immeasurably do more than all we can ask or even imagine. There is no one like our Lord. To him be the glory. To him be the praise. The one who redeemed us. Love and his grace. To him be the glory. To him be the praise. Throughout generations, forever. Amen. All you saints. All you sinners, come receive God's grace and love. 
is fullness of joy, life everlasting. There is no one like our Lord. To Him be the glory. To Him be the praise. The one who redeemed us with love and His grace. Thank you, David and Omar, for writing that song and sharing that and blessing our worship today. That song reminds us that God is so amazing and so beyond us that he is so generous in our lives to provide us with every perfect and good gift. And he shows that in Holy Communion as we celebrate Jesus' body and blood being given to us in bread and wine. So as we receive Holy Communion, we invite you to take this time to read our communion statement and prepare your hearts to receive this holy meal. Would you join with me in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then to will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'd like to invite all the communion assistants forward to prepare the elements at their stations and to receive communion. And while they're preparing the elements, this is a time when we go before our Lord to confess our sins, to confess our need for this meal, for the forgiveness of our sins, to reflect on this past week, and maybe we've said some things that we need to take back, but we can't, or we did some things that we wish we could undo, but they, we can't, and they're there, or maybe we neglected speaking up and standing up for something that was right, or that we're feeling guilty about something and it's weighing heavy in our heart. This is a time and a moment to confess those to our Lord, to go to him in whatever posture that you need, whether it's closing your eyes, folding your hands, but confessing to him and asking for forgiveness and for new life. So we go before our Lord and spend a few moments confessing our sin to him.
Lord, we pray that you would hear our confession and that you would help us to prepare this meal for the forgiveness of our sins and that we would receive your life and your grace and that you can do immeasurably more in our hearts and lives than we can ever imagine. So we thank you for your grace, Lord. And we thank you for hearing our confession and being faithful to forgive. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the night in which our Lord and Savior Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way also after supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Take and drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink this in remembrance of me. Glory day, the gifts of our Lord's body and blood are for you that your faith might be strengthened. Welcome to our Lord's table.
confession. He has given us this meal to forgive us of our sins. So go then trusting in that promise that your sins are forgiven and that you have new life because he lives and he lives in you and for you. Receive the forgiveness of our Lord that your sins are forgiven in his name. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to invite Pastor Dan forward for an immeasurably more moment uh, to let us know more about this campaign that we're embarking on and how you can take your next step with us here at Gloria Day. Hey, Glory Day. Uh, it is a joy and a privilege to be a part of this with you. Uh, through the next five weeks, we're going to be on this journey together. It culminates on October 27th, the Celebration Sunday. It's going to be a great day. You're going to hear a lot more about this capital campaign. If you go to our website, there's a landing page called the Measurably More uh, Landing Page, or Measurably More Page. Go on there. It's got so many resources on there. It has um, uh, resources from uh, Pastor Kay's teaching. It has our frequently asked questions. It has a PowerPoint presentation of the whole what we're doing. It has a bunch of different things there for you as well. The Bible studies, the small group resources, fantastic. But the reminder is our primary focus on this is about the kids. And so there's a great thing you're going to keep hearing about what that looks like for us through this capital campaign. Again, that pipeline, we're really building that pipeline. And I really pray you'll join us on this journey with that. We're going to get our feet wet together. If um, we, we're, we're starting a group of home group, or a series of home group gatherings where I'll be going to each one of those homes and be sharing more about this, give you a smaller setting to ask questions. I'll give you the whole presentation. Uh, if you still want to be a part of one, let us know. E email Amanda, email one of our staff and say, hey, I want to be in a home group gathering. We'll see if we can find you a spot uh, in one of those host homes. Uh, just let us know. We'd love to have you be a part of it. The biggest thing we want to do is share more information about this capital campaign to help you understand where God is leading us together as we move in the next three and a half years in ministry together. So thanks so much. I look out, I see many of you who attended last night's shrimp boil, and uh, good on you for being here in worship after that awesome event. Uh, if you were there, that is the, the energy and the excitement here at Gloria Day, uh, that this is a new future and we're charting a new course. Uh, another event that's coming up is the craft show. It's coming up October 18th and 19th. More information is on the screen. You can also scan the QR code and receive more information about that event. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but already we're turning the page to a new chapter, a new calendar, a uh, month called October. Uh, so to help you uh, be able to keep track of everything, uh, we have a, a guide of all the events in October that are happening. Uh, so our ushers, as you leave, will be handing those out. Be sure to take one, put that on your fridge, keep that in front of you so that you can see all the other events uh, that you can connect to and, and be able to take advantage of all of the opportunities uh, that God is creating here at Gloria Day. With that, I invite the congregation to please stand to receive our Lord's blessing in the benediction. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and continue to give you his peace and great joy now and always. Amen. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. so much for being with us this morning. We hope you guys have a blessed week.